When she was 15, she joined Islamic State, and now she is stateless. Today, British-born Shamima Begum has lost her appeal against the revoking of her citizenship in 2019. Born in East London, Begum and two of her friends shocked the world by fleeing to Syria to join ISIS after getting recruited online. During her time in ISIS, she worked as a recruiter for others to join the terror group, whilst also being an enforcer for the morality police. But after three of her children died shortly after childbirth, she wanted to return to the UK and was willing to face the music. But after backlash from her home country, then Home Secretary Sajid Javid stripped her of her British citizenship for being a danger to national security. As she has no other citizenship, she is now stateless. Her argument is that she is the victim of grooming and child trafficking as she was legally a child when she left England. So, is Shamima Begum a victim or a criminal? Should the British government have let her come back and face the consequences of her actions or let her wallow in the mess she made as a 15-year-old? Is it moral for countries to strip people of their citizenships? Should Shamima Begum have had her citizenship stripped? So let's get to it. Uh, should uh, Shamima Begum have had uh, her citizenship uh, stripped? As always, we begin with our quick fire round, 30 seconds each to let your initial stance on the uh, topic, and we'll pick it up uh, from there. So, uh, Mr. Ross Kane, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. Yes. The end. Okay. That's it. Okay, uh, but, but we will be asking you to elaborate further in a split second, but for the time being, Jonathan Lees, uh, your take? No, of course not. <laughs> it's a completely outrageous decision to strip um, someone who was literally a child and was a victim of, of grooming. Um, you know, if she has committed uh, an offence, then she should be tried for it in her home country. It is against all norms and morals to deny someone their citizenship. And it also speaks to a profound racism at the heart of the British state. They would never have done this to a white person, but they did it to her. Okay, last but not least, Martin Himmel, your, your thoughts? Well, I think that she should be allowed to go back to Britain, should have her citizenship, but she should face very severe punishment for her crimes. Joining ISIS is a very serious thing, even for a 15-year-old, and she stayed a lot longer than 15 and could have learned about what she did. So I think she should face severe retribution and uh, judgment in Britain, but should be allowed to go back. Okay, gentlemen, so let's feel free to interact from this point uh, onward. And, and allow me to begin with a very uh, intuitive question. Is, is uh, Bigham a danger to the UK, Russ Kane? Yeah, why not? Why, why do we, you know, doing the PR stunt, right? I've been in marketing and advertising for many, many years. Putting on a baseball cap and looking cool, mm -hmm in inverted commas, and looking suddenly Western, and all oh, look at me, I'm, I'm fine, don't fear me, right? Does not mean that your ideology has changed. And my argument is this, and this is how I, I draw the parallels, right? Whenever anyone attacks or dares to criticize Greta Thunberg, you're told, but she, oh no, but she's a child. Well, if she's a child, why does the world have to listen to her, all right? This, this young lady went out when she was 15. She didn't stay there, you know, for five minutes. She was there for some time and was heavily involved. This country, why would we assume that she's now absolutely fine and reg regrets it all? She simply wants to come back because she got caught out. That's, I think, much to the heart of the matter. Or if she does come back here, as I'm so sorry, I didn't catch your name, chap in the red, in the red, yeah, you're holding, you're, you're doing your face palm thing, fine. But here's the thing, mm. if she came back, it would be such a media mess. And she wouldn't face trial. She wouldn't face trial at all. She'd probably go on Strictly Come Dancing. Oh, okay, Jonathan, I'm curious uh, to, uh, his, to, I mean, to hear your take, yeah. I'm sorry, 
With the greatest respect to Ross, I've never heard such a load of rubbish in my entire life. Are you saying that we well, should breach how international I kind of felt law to stop I someone appearing? To you. Are you seriously suggesting that we should breach international law to stop someone from going on reality television? Now I've heard of everything. Shamila Begum, you may not like what not she did. What I, I said. don't like you what she did. Listen, what I listen. Mean. If she's done something illegal, she should be tried mm. for it. That's how the law works. So you don't strip someone of their citizenship and leave them stateless, which goes against all international conventions and norms. That is what we're talking about here. Not whether we approve of what she did. None of us does. It's about whether she deserves human rights. She is a human being. She does deserve human rights. And there are rights which are inescapable and irrefutable and ineluctable. And the whole point of human rights is that they apply the most particularly when you don't like someone. Otherwise, they're completely meaningless. M Martin, is it all security driven or punishment or, or a measure of, uh, of deterrence? I think it's a matter of deterrence, too. You've got to make sure that another terrorist group comes along. They don't just uh, find people. People know there'd be serious consequences if they go off like this and will not be let off the hook. Look, uh, my team did an, an investigative documentary on ISIS called Undercover in ISIS. Uh, it was broadcast in Canada and across Europe. And we actually had a Sarah who was a, a, a basically a mirage of a person, and we lured ISIS to try to recruit her. And there was a Swedish recruiter who tried to get her to come to Syria. It was all set up to come through Turkey. The this Swedish family, who were major terrorists in uh, in ISIS, wanted mm -hmm. to take her in. And I could tell you the 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 damage that a that a recruiter does is enormous. It preys on people who are susceptible, uh, who want to belong to something f uh, very definitive that's not um, ambiguous, and can create sheer terrible havoc in their lives. So if this uh, woman was a recruiter, also right there and there, she should be facing serious time in prison for what she did. If she doesn't face serious time, she shouldn't be let into the country because their deterrence is absolutely essential. But the point is, the point is where I actually agree with you, and here's the fundamental point, that I don't know whether Shamia Begum is, is guilty of any crime. And the whole point is that neither does anyone else because she hasn't been tried of anything. And the law in Britain is you're innocent until proven guilty. If Begum has been a recruiter for a terrorist organization and she is above the age of legal responsibility, um, then let her face trial for that. And if she's found guilty by, by, by court of her peers, by jury of her peers, then she should, of course, be, 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 be punished for that. No one is disputing that. The fundamental point is, whether she should actually come back to Britain in order to face that judicial process. That's what we're talking about. Not whether she should be free to kind of you know, go and strictly come dancing. Obviously, there are mitigating factors which you'd expect her defence to talk about in court, such as the fact that she was groomed, that she was a minor, and that she uh, feels uh, that she feels guilty about what she did, and all those other things. That is for a defence to mount. Uh, you know, an argument in a, in, a, in, a, in a court of law. We're talking about whether she deserves to be in that court of law, not about what happens after she gets there. So, so Russ Kane, is it all just a, a sign of mistrust in the UK legal process, in the wheels of justice? I think that plays a factor. I mean, what Jonathan is saying, um, and I was obviously being extremely facetious when I dragged in Strictly Come Dancing, because I meant dancing on ice. It is, a, it is a mistrust, and it's a feeling that she would come here and then, I don't know, Matrix, I don't mean the Matrix with Garnier Reeves, I mean the chambers called Matrix, would get hold. There'd be an enormous media campaign to have a rehabilitated, etc. Social media would go berserk. And so I think my fear is that the trial would be so skewed that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be effective. It may not even take place. That's no, what that's, not how, that's not how the law works, Ross. That's not how the law works. If you have, so if, if you have a trial in Britain, in, what, no. What no if you have a trial, if you have through. a trial in Britain, you have. You have certain yeah. guarantees about a fed trial. Mm -hmm. There are certain things you're not allowed to say in the media. There are contempt of court laws. The fear that she wouldn't, you know, that there would be a media circus. There, that just that isn't how the law works. That might happen in America. It doesn't happen in Britain. Russ, I'd like to, I'd like to point out. 
Russ, I'd like to point out that there's already a media circus, and it actually is working very what? badly yes. against Britain because uh, she's uh, good-looking, she dresses Western, yep. she looks hip, and there she is languishing yep. in Syria. So there's already this yep. media hype. I think the media uh, hype would actually work much better if she we saw her being arrested, taken into jail, and I think it would be incumbent on the British court to really give her a very serious sentence because it wasn't just the 15-year-old. It started as a 15-year-old, but it went on for many years. So she does have... Precisely. Uh, she does have the capability, but I think the media circus could work to your benefit because a strong sentence would send a message of deterrence. Now she's just this poor, lost uh, young soul dressed in uh, halter tops moving around the world. But, but, but gentlemen... Look, we're talking about... We're to it's Please not about don't. PR, it's about human rights. Uh, but, but, but this entire story, you know, it's a fundamental clash of civilizations between liberal democracies, a free society, and uh, Islamist fundamentalism. If the uh, liberal side of this divide is undermining its own uh, system of a proper legal process, isn't it a victory, so to speak, for the other side? I think that uh, if the media circus continues like this, that she's a cause celebre of a, of a lost stateless mm. refugee, uh, I think it's working very much against the West. That's why I think it's, more be it's better to see her in handcuffs in Britain facing a serious trial. I, I think the British should have more confidence in their system in justice, and I think she would get the sentence that she would deserve. The, the, I, I reject the idea of a clash of civilizations anyway, that sort of Samuel Huntington idea. I don't think that exists. It's not helpful for anyone. But I certainly think that a liberal democracy is built on a system of rule of law and uh, universal human rights. And Shamima Begum, as I said earlier, is a human being. And you cannot leave her stateless in Syria. I don't care about how she dresses. You know, that's that's a matter for her. And you know, how she might have a, a team, a media team, that's irrelevant to the point we're discussing. It's about whether she has human rights and about how they should be applied and you know, and if they and if you know they are to be applied then what happens after that so you know we can talk about a trial but that is several steps ahead right now we're talking about whether she has the right to actually yeah. have a citizenship that is a fundamental human right it is completely outrageous to me that britain should have lost its moral compass in this way by picking and choosing which of its citizens get to be british Russ. It's a very, very complicated issue, isn't it? I think the, the problem is, and I, I know Johnson's saying, well, you, you, I, I mean, both your guests are saying the media circus has already begun. I would even wonder if she would face trial. I think there'd be such hoo-ha if she's allowed back in, if she would even face trial. I, Jonathan, I take your point. I'm, you know, I'm being uh, deceptively naive when I say I don't understand about human rights, etc. But if she comes back in, mm -hmm. the fear is that if she doesn't get, it, as your other guest has said, the sentence that she deserves, especially for being a recruiter and for being there for okay. a pretty long time and bring other people in as well, then it isn't the wrong message goes out. Go and do what you like. There's no repercussions. And suddenly you're immediate. The message that she shouldn't That's be grieved. I mean, like we, we, she needs to have the court. She needs to have a court case. That's where that's the forum for these arguments to be aired. But she can't have that because she's not being allowed back into the country. That's what we're discussing. Okay, gentlemen, think, we, we do have to put a stop right here because we must uh, take a quick break. But obviously, we have so much more to unpack. So a few minutes break, and we're uh, back uh, with you and our uh, summit. So do not go anywhere. Welcome back uh, to the summit. Still with us, uh, journalist and commentator Jonathan Lees, uh, broadcaster and author Russ Kane and Martin Himmel, international security analyst. Thank you, gentlemen, for staying with us. We're also staying on topic. But before uh, we get back to our conversation, Let's take a listen to Shamima herself uh, before uh, speaking rather after she was initially uh, she got uh, her citizenship revoked rather back in uh, 2021. Let's take a listen. <clears throat> I mean, I don't think I can reassure them. I think only the government can reassure them. And the only way for the government to reassure them is if they come to see me or if they take me back. I think like a lot, a lot of teenage people, there I was at a vulnerable point in my life and it was just easy for people to take advantage of me and make me do things that I would not normally do if I wasn't so vulnerable. 
And just a clarification, her citizenship was revoked first in 2019, and this clip was for, from 2021, and now it's 2023. So let's get to it. Another quick fire round. Is it moral for countries uh, to make people stateless? Another quick fire round, 30 seconds uh, each, and we'll pick it up uh, from there. Jonathan, uh, you've uh, echoed uh, your sentiments on that before, but take the lead. 30 seconds are on. Fundamentally, it is not uh, appropriate or legal even for countries to uh, make their citizens stateless. Um, having a citizenship is one of the bedrocks of international human rights. Uh, we have a system of nation states and every single human being um, has the right to belong to one of those states to participate in a global society. So I don't think it's acceptable under any circumstances for a state to deprive a citizen. Even if she had a dual citizenship, I don't think it would be Martin Himmel, your thoughts? I think if you attain that citizenship as an adult, uh, then it can be revoked. If you're born into the country, I don't think it'd be revoked, but I do believe in the strength of law. I do have the confidence of law, and I think deterrence is essential. And even if it's capital punishment or life imprisonment, these, these, uh, sh these imprisonments should be employed. Russ Kane, last but not least. What about our rights? What about our rights to feel safe? What about our rights not to have buses, tubes, and... Uh, pop stadiums blown to pieces. What about those rights? Do we not have rights as well? Leave it there. Uh, we will open it uh, uh, here. Uh, Jonathan Lees, you're hearing Russ Kane. What do you think? Obviously, it is your right not to go about safely uh, in your daily business. I think we can all agree on that. If that right is taken away from you, it shouldn't be by a state, uh, it's by an individual, and that individual, uh, if they are still alive, should face the full force of the law. I mean, I don't think this is a controversial argument. Uh, if the state is taking away someone's rights, that is something different, because the, the rights are guaranteed by states. That's how rights work in the world that we've built around us. And one of those rights is a right to citizenship. And as I said before, human rights only really matter when they're being applied to people you don't like. If they're just about people like us, um, you know, people who haven't committed any serious crimes to my knowledge, then obviously they're like motherhood and apple pie. They, they're a great thing to have, and everyone agrees with them. It's about when you test it, about when you apply it to people who've done bad things. That's when we find out whether human rights actually exist. And if they don't exist, then we shouldn't pretend that they exist. But human rights really are that, rights for humans. Any single person is a human being and that goes with fundamental rights. That is a centuries-old proposition, which I don't think we should discard because we don't like someone. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so, so, so Russ, are we all citizens under condition? I'm oh, sorry, I don't understand your question. I, I'm asking if we're all con conditional citizens, according uh, to what well, you're we, saying. Well, I guess, I, I guess. I mean, what disturbed me about the clip that well, I, I don't, Jonathan, I don't really understand the question, quite frankly, but here's the thing, <laughs> right? What I didn't like about that clip, or what is really telling about that clip, you said it was in 2021, right. right? We're already saying, oh, I was vulnerable. I was young. Yeah, being young and vulnerable means that you go and buy Kyle Jenner and the Kardashians fashion clothes. What it doesn't mean is, it, is you leave home with your mates and go to a place and try and recruit other terrorists whose sole purpose is to, A, defeat the West and cause, as the name would suggest, there's the clue, terror, death and mayhem. That is not being vulnerable. So, so, so Martin... Ross, buying you're, you're in making to an ideology. No one, no, no one is disagreeing with you. No one is saying that they endorsed what she did. They're saying that she has fundamental human rights. That is the conversation mm. that we're having. No one is... No, I'm not going to say, oh, no, she actually did a really good thing. Obviously not. The whole no, point is course. that she has certain rights because she is a human being. Mm. I don't think you're going to say she's not a human being, are you? And therefore she no, has course. human rights. And this is what we're talking about. Well, the other side of the coin of that is that if you're going to let people keep their citizenship, and I think they should uh, in most cases, you must have strong deterrence and must, strong judicial enforcement. And unfortunately, that is glare, glaringly lacking in many countries. For example, in Sweden, the recruiter that we profiled 
how she was trying to lure women to come to the country, promising them being married to a wonderful jihadi and living wonderful lives when they're basically enslaved when they come and are pawned off to other people. She uh, was smart and managed to get out of uh, uh, the ISIS-controlled areas just before it collapsed. And she managed to get herself back into Sweden, and she hasn't been arrested. And I think that's a, tra a travesty because she uh, allured people to, re to be recruited to a very dangerous terrorist organization. And I'm, I'm a Canadian. I know other Canadians have, who were in ISIS got off very easy. So I think the real emphasis has to be on strong judicial enforcement because without that, there isn't real deterrence. So, so in the sphere of counterterrorism, Martin, there's no room for, for remorse? There is room for remorse. You can do it in prison with a long prison sentence and try to make things better. There's a lot of murderers who have remorse and, mm -hmm. and serve life for imprisonment. This woman should go to jail for scores of years, not a year or two and a yeah. slap on the wrist. Well, that, a final point, and that is for a court to decide after she's been tried by a jury of her peers. And there will be defense arguments put, a, put across, as you well know, about whether she was um, trafficked, uh, you know, about you know how she was groomed, about the role of Canadian intelligence in that, by the way, and all kinds of questions that will come to light yeah. about her treatment as a child. That is for a discussion in a court of law. That's not the discussion that we're having right now, which is about the fundamental human rights that pertain to her as a human being. But Jonathan, I do want to ask you, is portraying Shamima as a victim of, of grooming, of child trafficking, of, of sexual exploitation, uh, to an extent an insult to the real victims of, of Islamist extremism? No, of course not. Why is it either or? Why can't, you know, there, there's not just one kind of victim. You know, there, there are plenty of people who are, look, if she'd been, so, you know, uh, in her 20s, uh, that would have been a different thing. But we do have uh, age of consent. We yeah. do have age of majority in this country and elsewhere in the world. And that means that people are treated differently. And you, have, you do have uh, people who are more vulnerable to exploitation than other people. These are just facts. They're not just things that you say because they, you know, they suit your argument. If you are a child, that means that there is more leniency towards you in most circumstances because you're a child and you can be exploited by, by grown-ups who don't have your best interests at heart. That is clearly what's happened to Shamima Begum. It doesn't mean that she was completely blameless necessarily. It doesn't mean that she's completely yeah. innocent in what she did. It doesn't mean that she didn't think she knew what she was doing. It does mean that there are certain mitigating circumstances um, which, should, which are, are known to everyone because of the circumstances that we all know. Russ Kane, we're nearing the end of our discussion. Now your final yeah. thoughts. My final thoughts, I, I tell you what, Jonathan, in all seriousness, I will, I will bet you or take you out to lunch or whatever that if she comes back, and let's say she does, all right, I guarantee, as Martin has used the phrase, she'll get a slap on the wrist because the media will, it'll just be a nightmare. And I will bet you, lunch anywhere you like, that that's what right, will so happen. It's not about, so my, it's not that's the, my concern. It's not the media that decides it, it's the court of law that decides it. I it's know that, that you but it's 12 it's men, 12 good men, but you know and I know it's 12 good men and true, and don't tell me they're not influenced by what goes on on Twitter. On, on, okay, well, that's a discussion on, on about Instagram. the entire judicial process then. That's, that's a well, different conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Having. We yeah, all agree I mean, that people, not, yeah, we all agree that people have the right to a trial. Are you saying that people shouldn't have the right to a fair trial because of Twitter? No, that surely is not your not. argument. No, obviously not. not my argument. I used to be a lawyer myself. How could I possibly say that? So, <laughs> how can I possibly well, say? I, I, but I'm concerned. I, I, yeah. Martin has raised some huge points. That's yeah, the well, that's well. the perfect note uh, to put a hold or a pause to our discussion. Hopefully, we will uh, be seeing you again on the show uh, soon. Russ Kane, Jonathan Lee, Martin Himmel, thank you very much for this.